Please welcome Dr. Mustafa Youssef. Uh, I know Mustafa from my last year in college. He taught me in my senior year and um, it was an honor actually and he came here, he got his PhD from Maryland. He, he worked as a researcher there in the University of Maryland uh, for a few years and then he decided to go back to Egypt to help the students there and since then he established three wireless teams in, in three different universities and this is his current uh, university. And uh, since then, he, papers have been flowing to the top conferences like Mobisys and Mobicom. Uh, so it's actually a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Mustafa Youssef here today. Thank you for attending uh, the talk. I'm Mustafa Youssef from Egypt at Japan University of Science and Technology. And today I'm going to share with you our work on the Crowd Inside project where we target the automatic construction of indoor floor plans. So Crowd Inside is a part of a larger project which we call the ubiquitous indoor localization. So before I go to the, into the details of Crowd Inside, let me give you a, a brief uh, introduction to the ubiquitous indoor localization uh, projects. So as we know, GPS is considered a ubiquitous outdoor localization system. It works virtually everywhere around the world. However, there is no equivalent technology for indoor localization. There is no technology that I can turn on my cell phone and I get my location in any building around the world. And any building is the key word here. So if you think about it, we believe that there are two reasons uh, uh, for such technology not to exist till now. First one is that there is no technology for indoor positioning. Some of us may think that Wi-Fi is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. However, in order to get reasonable accuracy with Wi-Fi, you need to do calibration uh, or training of the site of interest. So it is not the case that you turn on your phone and your location is there without using any uh, overhead or calibration. The second reason is that there is no worldwide indoor floor plan database. The analogy I always give is that if you are outdoors and you are getting your location using GPS, if I give you the latitude and longitude coordinates, it's a couple of numbers that makes no sense. Without a street map, these coordinates are not useful for the user. So for indoors, if you don't have floor plans for every building around the world, even if you get your position through some technology, it is not, it's useless. I need a floor plan to display this uh, position on. So why are these uh, floor plans not available? Maybe they are uh, not available, for example, in developing countries or even in developing countries in the US and Europe, they are available, but no one is willing to take the effort to upload them. So as far as I know, the Google Maps for indoors have been released early this year. And in order to make, to make the technology work, you need to upload the map manually and you need to do some training, at least till now. So not to mention that you need, if you need to keep this uh, floor plan updated, someone has to take this effort uh, periodically. There are also some uh, privacy uh, concerns. So the target of Crowd Inside is specifically this second point, how to automatically construct the floor plans for virtually any building around the world. And the approach we take here is to leverage cell phones. Cell phones are with us 20, almost 24 seven, and they come equipped with uh, an array of sensors. They have uh, inertial sensors like accelerometer, compass, gyroscope, and they have cameras, microphones, GPS capabilities, you name it. So they are sensor rich. You can think of them as ubiquitous sensors. So if I can leverage these cell phones that are available with the users who use a building, either permanent users like employees, for example, in Google or visitors like myself are using this building and we're having our cell phones with us. If I can use these cell phones to get traces of motion inside the building, if I collect all these traces from different users, I can get an idea of the overall floor plan shape. So the goal of uh, uh, Crowd Inside is giving these traces in the top. I want to construct the uh, overall floor plan shape on the left, and I want to identify the points of interest, for example, like elevators, stairs, and escalators. And finally, I want to get the room shapes and number, like the figure on the right and the corridors. So in the rest of my talk, I'll start by uh, talking about Uptime, which is another system we developed as part of the ubiquitous indoor localization project, which targets uh, uh, constructing or achieving accurate trace generation. How can you achieve accurate traces of user inside a building? And based on this, we uh, crowd inside leverage these accurate traces to generate automatically the floor plan um, uh, process. 
Okay, so the goal of our time is to get accurate and ubiquitous tracking. By, by ubiquitous, I mean it works again virtually in any building around the world without requiring any infrastructure. And the approach we do is to leverage the cell phones, again, sensors, especially the uh, inertial sensors like accelerometer and gyroscope, because they are available on almost any smartphone and they don't require any infrastructure for calibration. We use a dead reckoning based approach. The challenge, of course, is that the noisy, the sensors on the phone are cheap and hence are very uh, noisy. And there are different phone orientations. The phone can be in your hand, in your pocket, in your uh, bag, you name it. So you need to have an approach that handles all these different uh, orientations and placements of the phone. Finally, we need to handle different humans and different devices. So different devices can have different characteristics. Different humans can have also different behaviors. So how can we capture this in a ubiquitous and accurate localization system based on dead reckoning? So theoretically, if you have the acceleration from the accelerometer, you can integrate it twice to get the displacement of movements. However, since the sensors are very noisy, double integration leads to a huge amount of error that grows cubically with time. So uh, previous work has reported that the error can exceed 100 meters after 30 meters of movement. So if you move just 30 meters, your error can be as large as 100 meters. And in our own experiments, the figure in the bottom shows that after 14 seconds of uh, operation, the error can reach up to 20 or 25 meters, which is significant. It cannot be reasonable for indoor localization, where you need to talk about a couple of meter accuracy uh, at maximum. So uh, previous work in the area of dead reckoning, of course, we are not the first to do that. What they did is that they used a, a special inertial measurement units that are uh, highly um, accurate. However, if I want to leverage the cell phones as a ubiquitous sensing device, sensors in the phone are uh, cheap and hence are uh, noisier, so we need to handle this noise. They also used step detection techniques. So instead of integrating the uh, acceleration, what you do, you do is you try to detect the number of steps of the user and then count these number of steps and multiply them by the average step size to get the actual displacement of the user. For this, they assume that there is a constant step size and current techniques usually use uh, sensors or accelerometer sensors that are mounted on foot or different bodies of the human uh, uh, person. In contrast, what we want to do is to use the cell phone in an arbitrary orientation. It, is, it doesn't have a fixed orientation on the body. We need to use it in any arbitrary orientation. So our time to uh, uh, highlight what we are trying to do is use a step detection approach. We need to detect the different user steps based on standard cell phones that can have arbitrary orientation and uh, placement. And also we need to detect the user gate. A user moving uh, slowly is the, uh, the step of a user moving slowly is different from someone who is running. So we cannot just use an average step length uh, to estimate the displacement. Otherwise, we'll get a large uh, error. So uh, in the rest of this part of uh, uptime system, I'll talk about the st step detection module and the stride length estimation module, and then we provide some evaluation uh, results. So uptime has two main modules, as we mentioned, the step detection module that takes the accelerometer reading and try to identify the boundaries of each uh, step. Then we move to the stride length estimation uh, module, where it's based on classification of three main classes, uh, moving, jogging, and running, based on some features that I'll uh, elaborate on uh, later. Let's start by the step detection module. So the figures uh, down, what you're seeing here is the uh, acceleration pattern you get when uh, a user is moving. On the figure on the left is when the phone is in hand, and the figure on the right is when the phone is pocket, and the y-axis is the magnitude of acceleration. And the point of using the magnitude of acceleration is that, as you can see, that the pattern is similar. It's more, it's noisier when we, uh, the phone is in pocket, but it's Basically, uh, it's like a periodic signal of going up and down as the move, uh, user is moving. So if we base our detection and uh, uh, feature selection on the magnitude of acceleration, we are to some extent independent of the phone orientation. So this is the way we handle the different orientation in the phone. And as I mentioned, when the phone is in bucket, it's noisier. So the second thing, given this figure, I want to separate the different steps. 
in order to count the different steps and to get the uh, displacement. And for this, we use a simple finite state machine. I'll go into uh, the details. Basically, it tries to detect the positive and negative peaks, and it have, oops, it have some states for uh, uh, handling the noise in the signal. So let's take it uh, in action. So this figure shows a typical user step. We start by state S0, which represents the stationary uh, state where a user is stationary. And actually, if a human is moving, you will find that between each step, there is some point where the user is completely stationary when he is moving or she is moving her uh, foot. So we start with this state. And if the acceleration magnitude goes above a certain th threshold, we enter state S1, which is uh, co which corresponds to possibly moving state. The moving state is uh, confirmed when a user reaches another threshold, which is a positive peak uh, detection. Similarly, you have to go to state S3 and S5 to detect that a negative peak has been uh, reached. And finally, the step is confirmed when the magnitude of acceleration goes below a th another uh, threshold, which is S6. So basically, using this uh, 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 simple finite state machine, you can detect the boundaries of a step accurately. Once we do that, we need to estimate the stride length of the movement. Is the user is moving uh, slowly, uh, jogging, or running in order to uh, get the actual uh, displacement within this step? And for this, we use, before I, I go into how we do it, uh, let's see what if, if I don't do it. So this table shows uh, for 100 steps, the error in uh, estimating the step. So if the user is walking, which is a reference, the error in estimating the step is almost 0%. However, if the user is running and I'm using a fixed step co corresponding to walking, the error can be up to uh, 130, uh, 130%. So it's significant. So what we are trying to do is to identify which class of these uh, uh, different gates the user is uh, doing and then use the corresponding step. This is performed for each user independently. So each one of us will have a different stride length as compared to others. So we estimate this for each uh, user. And maybe you can touch uh, later how to estimate it for a particular uh, user. So uh, what we are doing is we use a standard support vector machine classifier to differentiate between these three classes, again, walking, jogging, and uh, running. And it's a hierarchical. In the first level, we separate the slow gate from the fast gate. And in the second level, we separate the three different uh, classes. And of course, the main thing in any classifier is the features, what features you use to differentiate between the different classes. So we have a number of features. Uh, for example, the duration of the step, how long uh, is the, uh, remember that we uh, separated the steps using the first module. So based on this uh, separated step, we take features like the duration of the step, the variance of acceleration, the higher the variance, it means that the user is moving faster. The peak of the acceleration, again, the faster the mover, the user movement, the higher the peak of acceleration, along with uh, three other uh, features. Okay. Next. <laughs> So uh, here I'll show you how well we perform using this uh, technique for uh, uh, acceleration or uh, trace uh, generation. This figure shows compare our technique, which is a finite state machine in blue, to two of the current uh, techniques for uh, displacement or dead reckoning techniques, zero crossing, which uh, basically or simply counts the number of times the signal crosses uh, zero which is, if you think about it, similar to detecting the positive and negative uh, peaks in a simpler manner. And the local variance technique depends on just on the variance to estimate the uh, displacement or the step. You can see for different step sizes, our technique in blue significantly outperforms the other two techniques. And the main, if you want to quantify it, this figure has the three uh, different techniques for two different placements uh, of the phone, you can see that our technique has less than 9.3% uh, error in both cases, and on average have less than 6% error in detecting the uh, number of steps. The uh, other technique has significantly more error, and the reason for that, when they were designed, they were designed for sensors attached to the uh, foot or different body of the uh, person, not for uh, different orientations. So uh, that's why we can achieve much better accuracy. 
this table shows the classification, uh, the confusion matrix for the three different classes. And you can see that our accuracy is more than 97% in detecting the actual gate of the user, which is uh, very accurate. We applied this in a real environment where we moved around our campus. So uh, this experiment, the trace length is about 600 meters. And for over the entire trace, the error was less than 7% uh, overall in outdoors. Similarly, for indoors, we had another uh, experiment where the error was less than 6%. Of course, for the inertia and sensors, it doesn't make a difference whether you are indoor or outdoors. It's mainly the trace lens that makes um, a difference. To summarize this part, uh, at time combines a finite state machine approach to detect the number of steps. And for this, we can achieve less than 6% error in detecting the number of uh, steps. And then uses a support vector machine classifier to detect the step lengths. And for this, we can achieve more than 97% um, accuracy. Overall, combining the error in the step detection and the uh, step length, we can achieve less than 7% error. Even though this is good and much better than the set of the art, it is still linear with the error is still linear with displacement. So the more you move, the absolute error is 7% of what uh, you moved. So uh, of course, this as you move away from your starting point, initial point, the error at some point may become prohibitive for indoor localization. So what Crowd Insight does is that it takes up time and builds on it to even enhance the trace generation further, as I'll uh, show in my next uh, part of the talk. So let's change gear and move to Crowd Insight. So Crowd Insight has four main uh, modules. The data collection module that collects the data from the user, and then the motion traces generator that is based on uptime, but it, it works, it extended further to enhance the accuracy uh, more. And then the anchor extraction module that is uh, the main function is to detect the point of interest inside the environment, like elevators, stairs, and escalators. And finally, the core of the system is the floor plan estimation module. So let's talk each one of these modules one uh, by one. So Crowd Inside uh, collects three main types of information. The first one is the inertial sensor information, the accelerometer, gyroscope, and the uh, compass. And also it connect, uh, collects Wi-Fi information that we will use later to separate the different uh, rooms. And finally, it collects GPS information to detect the transition from uh, outdoors to indoors and detect the building entrance location. However, as we know, GPS is a very uh, energy hungry device. So we run it as a very low duty cycle in order to conserve uh, energy. Once we have the data from the user, uh, Crowd Inside uses uptime, the technique we just uh, described using the finite state machine and the stride lens estimation to estimate the user step. However, as we mentioned, uh, the accuracy is linear with time. So in order to enhance this further, uh, Crowd Inside combines the trace generation with the anchor based uh, estimation to get uh, more accurate estimation. So this makes us move to the anchor extraction module. The basic idea is that if you can detect that you are at an anchor point or a point of interest, you can use this anchor point to reset your error. So for example, the blue curve gives you the accuracy of uptime or the error in uptime as you move away from your starting point. So initially you start at a known position, so your error is zero. However, as you move away in time, the error increases linearly. If you detect that I am at a point of interest, for example, that I am in the elevator, you can reset your error to the uh, your position to the position of eleva the elevator. And then instantaneously, your error drops to zero. And this is what we show in the verbal curve. So initially, the error was increasing at about uh, 100 uh, seconds. You detect that you are at an anchor point. So you reset your position to this anchor point, And then your error increases linearly again and until you hit another access point and so on. Two things to note here. First. When you hit an anchor point, it is not just you correct your current position because you can go backward in time and do interpolation and correct your entire trace. So it, not, it is not only corrects your current position, but corrects your entire history of movement. So if you are, want to do something offline in real time, of course, this is uh, not helpful. But if you are doing offline analysis, that can be extremely helpful, especially in our technique, because all the analysis of crowd inside can be done in offline. The second thing here is that the point of interest doesn't have to have a physical meaning. 
So as I mentioned, it can be escalators, elevators of stairs. But in general, for example, in our work, we use turns. A turn itself it can be a point of interest or a, a unique point in the environment. So whenever you can, you make a turn, if you use map matching techniques, you can know, reset your error to the correct location. We have another piece of work I'm not showing here uh, that we published in Mobisys this year, where we try to learn the anchor points using unsupervised learning technique, where you can, you want to determine unique points in the environment without knowing what they refer to. So you don't need to understand what they mean. What you need to know is that this is a unique signature in the environment. When this increases, we found that you have a lot in indoor environments, you have a lot of uh, this anchor points or uh, points of interest that can be used to reset your error and gain uh, significant accuracy. As I will show you later in the evaluation, our accuracy using this error resetting techniques based on the anchor points can reach less than three meters in indoor environments, which is very good for our own purposes. So for uh, the next couple of slides, I'll show you the different kind of anchors we extract and how we extract them. Basically, we have two kinds of anchor points, inertial-based, based on the inertial sensors, and GPS-based anchor points. So let's start by the inertial-based uh, anchor points. Uh, here, we want to differentiate between three main classes, escalators, uh, stairs, and elevators, in addition to the uh, being stationary and walking. So we have five different classes to differentiate from, just based on the inertial uh, sensors and the other sensors in the phone. So let's see how we can do it. Let's start by the elevator. The elevator has a very clean and repeatable uh, pattern. Whenever you want to uh, get to the elevator, you have a period of silence where you are waiting for the elevator to arrive. And then when you start moving, if you are moving down, you have a period of weight loss when it starts moving. And then you have a period of constant velocity or zero acceleration. And finally, when it stops again, you have an opposite uh, uh, period of weight, uh, weight gain. Again, this pattern is unique and repeatable and very clean, so we can use a simple finite state machine like the one on the left, not only to detect you are in the elevator, but to determine the direction of going up or down. In addition, you can use the time spent in the elevator to determine how many floors you traveled inside using the elevator. So we, by this, we can separate uh, the elevator. Once we do that, we want to differentiate between the other four different classes, for example, for the escalator. What is unique about the escalator is that when you are using the escalator, it has a constant speed. So this can be detected uh, using the accelerometer. However, if you are stationary, you are also having a constant speed of zero. So in order to differentiate between being stationary and using the uh, elevator, we use another feature, with the, which is the variance of the magnetic sensor. And the, the main idea here is that when you are using the escalator, there is a, a large motor that is running this escalator, and this motor affects your uh, magnetic field, and you can capture this by the variance of the magnetic field as shown on the left. Sorry, on the right. So the blue curve is the uh, being the variance of the magnetic field when you are stationary, and the uh, uh, red curve is the variance of the magnetic field when you are using the escalator. So we can use this feature to separate the uh, escalator from being stationary. The last uh, inertial anchor point I'll talk about is using the stairs. And the problem with the using the stair is how to differentiate between using the stairs and walking. You can think that if I am using the stair, I am moving in 3D. And actually, this is the uh, main idea. But the feature we use that we find it can separate these two classes of walking and stairs is the correlation between the Z and Y um, magnitude of the acceleration, where y is the acceleration in the direction of motion, and z is the direction uh, perpendicular to the plane of the uh, phone if the phone is in hand. If it is not, you can use the gyroscope and compass to reorient it. And again, the basic idea here, if you are moving in 2D, you are not using the stairs, you are moving a positive displacement in the y direction, while there is no positive direction in the z direction, therefore the correlation is almost zero. However, if you are using the stairs, you are having both displacement in the y direction and the z direction, and hence the uh, correlation is much higher than the other case. So based on uh, the correlation between z and y uh, uh, acceleration magnitudes, you can uh, detect or separate the two classes of walking and stairs. So this uh, decision tree shows how we can differentiate between the five different classes. Elevator is separated at the top using its uh, unique pattern. And then the four different classes are separated based on the accelerometer and magnetic sensor, uh, as I explained in my previous uh, slides. Uh, 
So let's move to the other type of the anchor points, which is GPS-based anchor points. So we can use the GPS to detect the building entrance. And the idea is if you are running your GPS continuously, the point you detect is that there is a loss of the GPS signal, you know that you moved from indoors, so from outdoors to indoors, and then you can determine the door position. Of course, the main challenge here is the energy consumption. You cannot run your GPS continuously. So what we do is that we run the GPS at a low duty cycle. And if you do this, you detect the loss of the GPS signal after some uh, time. So your estimate of the door position would be coarse grained. So whenever we detect the loss of the GPS signal, we estimate the door position at the midpoint of the last reported GPS and the time or the position where you lost the GPS signal inside the building. So it's, it's represented by a blue uh, cross. And if you repeat this from uh, a multiple of times, uh, a large uh, theory of large numbers tells us that you will uh, get on average the location of the average or traces, you will get the position of the door accurately. And I quantify this later in the evaluation uh, section. So to summarize, the anchor extraction module is useful for two things. First, to reset the error. So whenever I hit an anchor point, I can reset the error in the trace to the current uh, position of the anchor points, and hence I can have better trace uh, generation. And the anchor themselves are useful to enhance the semantics of the map. I can have a higher level of semantics on top of the map using these uh, anchors. So let's move to the next module, which is the core of the system, the floor plan estimation module. Once I have accurate traces, how can I use these traces to estimate the overall plan, floor plan shape on the left and to determine the room boundaries and the corridor uh, shapes on the right? Of course, there, is, uh, there are details in the paper. I'll just go over all the, the basic idea. So we start by the traces. Where what we are showing here on this figure is 300 traces collected from different uh, four different users. Then we get a point cloud where each point represents a user step. So for each step from these traces, we represent it by a single uh, point. And then we apply alpha shape alpha shape to capture the uh, shape of the building. Alpha shapes is a generalization of a convex uh, hull. And you can see that the gray area represents the overall uh, uh, floor plan shape uh, accurately. I have a demo at the end. I'll show you this in action. So in order to get the, uh, the room shapes, just not to stop at the overall layout, what we do is that we segment the traces. So we start by the trace itself and segment it into parts based on the turns. So when this is, there is a significant change in direction, we break this trace into a new uh, segment. Then we classify each segment as either in a corridor or, or a room. So we need to separate the corridor out so that the remaining segments will represent the different rooms. And for this, again, we use uh, different features like the average time spent per step. The main intuition here is that when you are moving in a corridor, usually the user moves faster than when he's inside a room. So these different features try to capture the, these differences between being in a corridor or a room. So if you have more time per step, it means you are using faster, so most probably you are in a corridor. The segment length, again, uh, a longer uh, segment, it's expected to be more in a corridor rather than in a room. And the neighborhood segment density, a corridor, again, is used by more people than the people using a room. So you uh, mostly will have uh, more density of traces inside a corridor than as compared to uh, a room. And you can see in this figure, the blue curve represents the segments classified as corridors, and the black uh, segments are those representing segments inside rooms. So you can see that we can accurately detect or separate the corridors from rooms. Once the rooms are separated, what we do is that we uh, try to cluster these uh, rooms. And for clustering, we use two features, the spatial distance. And of course, this is not enough because nearby rooms cannot be separated by just uh, distance. So the other feature we use is the Wi-Fi we collected uh, from the user. And the idea here again is that two adjacent rooms will have, because of the walls separating them, will have different signatures. So they can Wi-Fi signals can be used to separate different adjacent uh, rooms. Once we do this, we have clusters, each cluster representing a room, and then we recursively apply the alpha shape to individual clusters to get the uh, uh, shape of the room. 
And you can see that we can accurately, to some extent, capture the shape of the room. We can, of course, do smoothing to enhance the shape of the room, like a rectangular shape, uh, to have a better uh, display. However, we believe that in many rooms may not follow the uh, rectangular shape, so it can be based on the user uh, preference. So what remains is a small detail, which is detecting the room doors. If I can detect the rooms, detect the corridors, can I detect also the location of the door of the room? And for this, we use again a simple technique where we detect the points that moves from a segment belonging to our corridor to a segment belonging to a room. So in this case, you will highlight these different uh, points. This will give us a cluster of points where each cluster represents a possible location for a door. And then we use uh, the center of mass of these points to detect the room position. And you can see that we can accurately detect the room position uh, using this simple uh, technique. So let's quantify our, I just show you some visual uh, clues. Let's me, let me quantify the accuracy and the different parameters. In order to evaluate our system, we used different Android uh, phones and two main test beds, one in a shopping mall, mainly to test the uh, accuracy of detecting the uh, uh, points of interest, stairs, elevators, and escalators. And we use a building one floor in our uh, campus uh, building. We collected 100 uh, traces. And the trace contains many segments. So we have about 300 segments for these 1,000 traces. These traces were collected by four uh, volunteers in 12 different rooms and all the corridors. And for, for this, we used the lowest sampling rate, which is the uh, user interface delay. And we believe if you use this sampling rate, our energy consumption would be lower because uh, the phone is running in the background. The uh, accelerometer chip with this rate in order to detect the change in orientation. So if you base our sensing on this rate, hopefully our energy consumption would be uh, much lower. So this uh, figure shows the number of samples required to detect the door position. So here we are trying to detect the door using uh, sampling and doing averaging in the uh, theory of large numbers. And you can see that using just 100 samples, we can uh, detect the in door entrance location with an error of less than one meter, which is very uh, good. This figure shows the uh, required number of samples to achieve a certain accuracy for detecting the building entrance for different duty cycle lengths for the uh, GPS uh, sensor. And you can see that even for a very low duty cycle of six minutes, we can achieve uh, one meter accuracy using uh, about 1,200 samples. I remind you that these number of samples are amortized over the number of users that use the building. So in a building like this, you have hundreds of users and visitors. You can collect, get this accuracy in a couple of days, if not a couple of hours. And again, we are doing this in a distributed manner for all building around the world. This is the key point. This table shows the confusion matrix for the five different classes of points of interest, we, uh, inertial uh, points of interest that we are trying to detect. And you can see that for 170 traces, the accuracy uh, we can achieve 0.2% false positive rate and 1.1% false negative rate. Again, this is for each point of 170 is representing a case. However, if you, are, if you have a large number of traces, a large number of users using this building, you can reduce this further to almost 0% error because you are doing sensor fusion from all the users that are using this building over, over time. This figure shows the CDF of distance error for the trace uh, generation. The uh, black curve is using just up time, and you can see that the median distance error is about 30 meters. This is for the entire uh, test bed uh, area. If you uh, use up time and then do anchor based correction, your error drops to about eight meters. And if you do anchor corrections and you take turns as anchors, the error drops to less than three meters, which is very uh, accurate for indoor uh, environments. Finally, this figure shows how many traces we require in order or segments uh, we require in order to estimate the correct number of rooms in the building. And you can see that about 280 uh, segments are enough to estimate the actual number of rooms. Again, this is amortized over the number of users who are using uh, the building. So uh, to conclude, I hope I, I showed you that Crowd Inside leverages the ubiquitous cell phones to automatically estimate the uh, floor uh, plans. 
it uses a novel technique of error resetting based on the points of interest inside the area of interest to get accurate user uh, traces. And the nice thing is that it doesn't require any special infrastructure or uh, to generate the user traces or the indoor floor plans, and they can work in parallel for all buildings around the world. Of course, this is just the beginning. There are a lot of challenges and open problems, including infer inferring higher level semantics. So can I differentiate between a meeting room and a normal office, for example, based on the patterns of the user inside the uh, room? Can I differentiate between a coffee shop and a bookstore inside a mall? Again, automatically based on the traces I collect. Can I identify the person or the owner who is of this uh, room? All of these are different or higher level of semantics that are still open to investigate. If you go back to the Victor's Indoor Localization Project, once I, uh, once I have an accurate trace generation uh, tool, like we uh, combining uptime with crowd inside, I can use this to automatically save the uh, fingerprint for Wi-Fi based localization. So while the, the, the telephone is in my pocket and the user is moving, he's automatically constructing the fingerprint, uh, Wi-Fi fingerprint of this building. So I can use it for accurate Wi-Fi localization without doing any explicit calibration. And as any other crowdsourcing based approach, user incentives is a challenge. Energy and privacy concern also are open problems still that needs uh, uh, thoughtful solutions in order to address them. And this concludes my talk. I uh, hope uh, you liked it. You, if you need more information, you can go to the project website where you can find papers and other media uh, coverage. And I'd like at the end to acknowledge uh, that this work is sponsored by a Google Research Award. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, I, you, uh, I can have them or I have a demo. I can show it first and then go to the questions. OK. So. So this is a tool where we have traces collected in an offline. Uh, I'm replaying the traces we collected that we are using in the paper. OK, so let's start uh, by showing the, if I just use the convex hull, just redisplaying the traces, you can see that the convex hull simply doesn't capture the overfloor blend shape because it has concave concave area inside. So convex hull is not the right solution to use. Instead, if I use the alpha shape and do the same uh, thing, you can see that the alpha shape can capture the uh, building layout nicely. There are some areas that were not covered by the traces because we didn't have access to them. So they are not included in the overall blend shape. But for those areas that were visited, you can see that the alpha shape nicely captures the floor plan. Of course, alpha shape have uh, parameters. So for example, if you set it to infinity, it gives you the convex hull. That's why the alpha shape is a generalization of the uh, convex hull. Uh, what else can we show? We can also, let's move to the uh, room, individual room uh, generation. So in order to show this, this is the point cloud corresponding to the uh, traces we collected. The blue represents the points classified as corridors using our classif classifier and features I showed you in a couple of minutes. And the red represents the rooms, the points that were classified as rooms. If I do clustering on them, Actually, I can show it as segments too. However, if you go to points and then do clustering, you can see that just using distance for clustering, what you can see is that the rooms on the top have one color. They cannot be separated. This is because they are close in distance. Similarly, there are rooms in the bottom. So if I show the overall floor blend shape using this clustering, you can see that the rooms cannot be separated. It merged a couple of rooms together. However, if I use Wi-Fi as another feature for clustering, you can see that using Wi-Fi have separated the different rooms as uh, required. And if I want to get the final floor plan shape, you can see that here we can capture the rooms and the rooms using alpha shapes uh, closely represent the different rooms in the area of interest. Finally, to show the uh, get the door uh, locations, 
what we are showing here, the black dots represent the points where we move from a segment representing a corridor to a, point, a segment representing a room. So we can get these small clusters. If I get the center of mass of these different clusters, I can get the uh, door, uh, room door position. And this is the final floor plan you can get using our crowd inside in this particular uh, building. And that's it. Any questions? Please. No, actually. Uh, so what we do is that whenever you enter uh, the building, you detect the loss of the GPS signal, so you know your starting position. And once you move indoors, you're just using the inertial sensors for uh, detecting your location. Of course, this was a controlled experiment. So for all traces, we have we know the starting point, and then we get the displacement inside the building. In general, what we are thinking about is you can use other users as uh, resetting points. So you have a trace from one user that intersects a trace from another user. So you can take this intersection point to reset the error on the less accurate trace. This clear? So for example, there is a, a user that just entered the building and he started moving and there is a, a person who has been moving for a long time. When they intersect, you can now correct the longer trace using the shorter trace. Also, the loss of the GPS signal doesn't have to be at the door entrance only. It can be near windows. So for example, here you can get a good, at least you can have this loss of GPS signal, so you can use these as GPS-based reference points. Other questions? So how long will it take? Because I think the third has a lot of factors. Right. How long can have to be for the registered? Did they have to be? To register to so again, it, it doesn't depend on the trace length. It depends on the density of the anchor points. So if the trace is long, but you are resetting your uh, error in the trace frequently, your error would not grow significantly. And this is what we noticed by the so wave pattern you saw, that your error increases and then decreases. And as I mentioned, it is not that you correct your error at this particular point. You can go back and correct the entire uh, trace. On average, how dense we find it indoors, I don't have the number in mind, but we have found that, again, that uh, we call these explicit anchor points, where you have templates, you learn the anchor points using these templates, like the template for the elevator. But in our Mobius paper, uh, we, you are welcome to uh, take a look at it. We have also unsupervised anchor points, where we learn anchor points that doesn't have a template on the fly. And then we found that it's very frequent that your error is almost uh, less than three meter in uh, indoor environments. Okay, please. So uh, it seems like you're detecting steps or jogging and so on based on, well, let's see what those are like in that box model. Right. Um, is there some sort of automated way to decide what the feature is like um, uh, rather than say, just looking directly at the Right, so currently we are using just a number of features. Some of them have been used before and some are introduced uh, by us. We haven't thought about automating the detection of features themselves, but at least we thought about automating detecting the uh, stride length of the user. And the basic idea, if you are moving outdoors, for example, you are getting a reference point, which is two GBS locations. And then based on the distance and the number of steps within this distance, you can get the average distance uh, bear a walking step of the user. If you take less time, it means that you are moving faster, so you can get an estimate of the average uh, jogging step of the user. But for the feature themselves, no, we didn't uh, have automated ways for detecting the features for the different stride lenses. Please. Right, the periodicity can be also, uh, because as I showed in the figure, the main idea is that you detect a positive peak and the negative peak. So it's, the segment is periodic to some extent. So actually using periodicity can be used as another way of detecting steps. Uh, but we haven't looked into this uh, in this work, particular work. It's, it's a good suggestion. Please. Hey, uh, 
failure to use these anchor points, that's error. Right. Um, you don't know the fault plan. Right. Right, so it's the question is a chicken egg problem. In order to reset your error, you need to know the location of the anchors. But initially, you don't know the location of the anchors. And in order to get the location of the anchors, you need accurate traces. So it's both ways. So uh, uh, what the, the plan to do it, or actually what it is not shown in this work, but what we are doing uh, currently, is that we use a SLAM-like slam approach where you simultaneously detecting the uh, motion trace and detecting the location of the anchor points. The uh, point I mentioned that whenever you hit an anchor point, you can go backward and correct your location also helps in that. So the answer is yes, you can do concurrently, uh, do both of them concurrently. And the traditional theoretical technique is using something like SLAM, for example, to do it. Exactly. So basically, we do Wi-Fi based uh, localization for the anchor point. So based on the anchor point, you can know separate w whether it's the elevator this part or the elevator on the other part. Other questions? Yes. So actually, I cannot separate the traces. So here we are having the 100 trace, I believe that we talked about 106 traces, but I cannot uh, separate them. But what is your question, particular? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Right, and the turns. Yes. And then this small, so the question is, they are, the traces are very accurate. And the reason is the error resetting technique. It is not just based on the stairs, it's based on the user, user turns. And actually here we are using also the uh, Wi-Fi. So you can use Wi-Fi themselves as anchor points. No, this is not the output of the slam. This is just based on the error resetting and going backward and correcting the traces once you hit an anchor point. Okay. Manually find that point. I the stairs, the stairs is there. The turns are not so both the stairs and yeah. So for here the ground truth is known. The stairs position are known. We are not doing the slam and the turns of course is detected by the change in the compass. And that association is done using Wi-Fi. Can I ask what instructions you gave the system? Um, uh, it seems like a lot of buildings you might go halfway in and meet somebody you know and know around. And sort of right. So again, this was a very controlled environment yeah. where uh, people were instructed to, and actually having the ground truth was for this uh, different traces wasn't uh, easy because we didn't have uh, a way to get uh, ground truth. So basically, the users have to click where they are standing, where they were moving in order to get the ground uh, truth. So uh, the traces wasn't an arbitrary movement of a person who is having the phone and moving all day. It was a controlled start from here, try to cover the entire uh, area. Yes. Were the volunteers, were they aware? And they were aware. They were aware. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Station meaning the ground truth or the error resetting? So the error resetting, of course, when you have these, then we have the positions. So the, all this is done offline. So you get the traces from the user, and then you do offline processing in order to extract, to uh, correct the traces using the error resetting, and to go backward in time and to correct 
the user trace. Other questions? So, Please. Um, how was it expected to be uh, uh, enforced on where not taking 19 and other types of reset? So, the question is if they don't take a turn, it wouldn't be reset? If they take, well, so here we see every, every turn is like a question. Right. Um, how would you expect it to be if uh, users were like cutting turns and uh, turning sometimes early, sometimes fast? Would you be able to still detect that? And uh, yeah, do you expect it to work if you don't have surveyors? But so actually, uh, taking it to the second level, which is giving it to normal users moving in arbitrary manner is a challenge, of course. Uh, in many cases, it wouldn't work, but we believe that the basic idea here is that you are having hundreds of users, if not thousands, that are using the building at the same time at different times of the day. Even the same user is using the building at different times of the day. So if you fuse these all together, you can easily detect outliers. And you can throw through a, a lot of these uh, idiosyncrasies. Uh, however, we haven't tried it. So still, it's open. It's one of the challenges, of course, is taking it to the real uh, environment and seeing how a normal user and having it in bucket will uh, behave. Other questions? Uh, yes. Yeah. So when you have um, all the original trajectories, Right. So then there's some process that has to cluster those together, patch or patch together. What forms is that not? No, I didn't get the question. This is for detecting the turn based anchor points or? Once you detect the anchor points, okay. um, you then have to attach anchor points and patch together. To do what? So in order to correct the user trace, is this what you mean? Yeah, you're adding a constraint to the user trace. Right. Exactly. So there's some process that has to identify those anchor points. So basically, you are generating a trace without any correction, and then you detect that a user made a turn. So at this particular point, you are trying to search what is the nearest anchor point to this particular location. Exactly. And it's basically based on also on the Wi-Fi signature. So at this particular location, I'm hearing some access points. And at this particular anchor, it's registered that this is the Wi-Fi signals that is captured at this point. So this is the way you do the data association or uh, gluing two traces together. Uh, we haven't tried it, but again, we are currently working on this slam thing, was it, whether it's related or not. I think it would be hard to do with on a global scale because of, as I mentioned, there is a large, if you take a large mall, for example, there will be a large number of uh, anchor points in this building or this uh, floor. But no, we haven't tried it yet. Other questions? Great. One more question. And the charts that people make inside the room for this particular test, right. are there anchor points there? Or were the anchor, the anchor points you said were chosen beforehand? But right. would there be any inside the room? For uh, rooms, I think mainly it's around tables and uh, maybe in this particular uh, environment, the authors, the people or the students were instructed to make. 90 degrees turns to make it cleaner. But as far as I believe, it's mainly around the tables and furniture inside uh, the room, if I am not mistaken. And as you can see inside the room, maybe uh, it's skipping or maybe not accurate as in the corridors because of the randomness inside the room. Great. Thank you very much. And I'll be available after the talk if you are interested in discussing more.